The 1800s. Napoleon is very tolerant in his attitude towards the Jews. As a result, he has won the respect of many of them, but he has his motives. Historian Rabbi Barel Wine reveals that Napoleon was primarily interested in seeing the Jews assimilated rather than prosper as an alien community. Quote, Napoleon's outward tolerance and fairness toward Jews was actually based upon his grand plan to have them disappear entirely by means of total assimilation, intermarriage, and conversion. End quote. This attitude can be seen from a letter Napoleon wrote in November 1806. Quote, it is necessary to reduce, if not destroy, the tendency of Jewish people to practice a very great number of activities that are harmful to civilization and to public order in society in all the countries of the world. It is necessary to stop the harm by preventing it. To prevent it, it is necessary to change the Jews. Once part of their youth will take its place in our armies, they will cease to have Jewish interests and sentiments. Their interests and sentiments will be French." End quote. Again, privately, in an 1808 letter to his brother Jerome, Napoleon makes his assimilation plans clear. Quote, I have undertaken to reform the Jews, but I have not endeavored to draw more of them into my realm. Far from that, I have avoided doing anything which could show any esteem for the most despicable of mankind. End quote. 1808 in response to complaints about Jewish moneylenders, Napoleon had, in 1806, suspended all debts owed to them. In 1808, he goes a step further and issues a decree that the moneylenders refer to as the infamous decree. Napoleon wants the Jews to move away from their traditional moneylending practices and become farmers and craftsmen instead. His decree... His decree severely restricts the practice of lending and annuls all debts owed by married women, miners, and soldiers. Any loan that had an interest rate exceeding 10% is also annulled. Napoleon's religious tolerance is admired by many of the Jews, but his efforts to regulate usury upset the Jewish moneylenders and seals his fate. That is why, to this day, they refer to Napoleon's decree as the infamous decree. Led by Nathan in Britain, the five Rothschild brothers of Europe, based in Britain, Germany, Italy, Austria, and France, are determined to destroy Napoleon before his anti-debt monetary philosophy can take hold in Europe. 1808 to 1814. British international intrigue draws Spain into war against its former French ally. The years of fighting in Spain takes a heavy burden on France's grand army. While the French win battle after battle, their communications and supply lines are severely tested. French units are isolated, harassed, and slowly bled to death by guerrilla fighters. The Spanish armies are repeatedly beaten, but time and again they regroup and hound the French. This drain on French resources leads Napoleon to call the conflict the Spanish Ulcer. 1809 Once again, the Austrians and British, these people simply will not quit, join forces to try to overthrow Napoleon, and once again Napoleon thumps the Austrians, this time at the Battle of Wagram, July 1809. But the British remain active in Spain, slowly wearing down the French. 1811. Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I of Russia had been enjoying friendly personal relations. By 1811, however, tensions increase as Alexander comes under intense pressure from political forces within the Russian nobility to break off the alliance with France and enter into Coalition 6, heavily funded by Nathan Rothschild. Fearing another two-front war, Napoleon threatens serious consequences if Russia forms an alliance with Britain. In 1812... Advisors, intriguers, to Alexander suggests an invasion of the French Empire and recapture of Poland, now an ally of France. On receipt of intelligence reports on Russia's war preparations, Napoleon prepares for a preemptive offensive campaign against Russia. The invasion begins on June 23, 1812. In support of its never ending wars against Napoleon, the British Navy forces unwilling individuals into service. Residents of seaports live in fear of the impressment gangs that patrol waterfronts and raid taverns, pouncing on deserters and idle mariners. Prints from the time show armed gangs kidnapping men in their beds or barging into weddings and hauling the groom out much to the distress of the bride. 
But generally, pressing takes place at sea, where the armed gangs board merchant ships. These ships are ransacked of their men and often left without sufficient hands to take them safely into port. American ships are stopped and searched in British waters. Anyone born in Britain is seized. Sometimes American citizens are taken by mistake. Between 1793 and 1812, the British impress more than 15,000 sailors to supplement their fleet. By June 1812, the U.S. has had enough. The United States declares war on Great Britain, citing in part the British practice of impressment. September 7, 1812. The fighting at the Battle of Borodino in Russia involves 250,000 troops and results in about 80,000 casualties, making Borodino the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon's Grand Army launches an attack against the Russian army, driving it back from its positions but failing to score a decisive victory. Both armies are exhausted after the battle, and the Russians withdrew from the field the following day. Moscow will fall a week later, but because the Russian army was not badly beaten enough to be rendered ineffective, the French are unable to bring Tsar Alexander back to the peace table. After their loss at Borodino, the Russians avoid Napoleon's objective of a decisive engagement and instead retreat deeper into Russia. Owing to the Russian army's scorched earth tactics, the French find it hard to forage food for themselves and their horses. Napoleon's own account quote, The most terrible of all my battles was the one before Moscow, Borodino. The French showed themselves to be worthy of victory, but the Russians showed themselves worthy of being invincible. End quote. Napoleon retreats from Moscow with most of his grand army intact. On the long march home, Typhus wipes out most of his men. One by one, Napoleon's allies will become former allies and members of the Sixth Coalition. 1812 to 1814. From his base in London's financial district, known as the City, Nathan Rothschild single handedly continues to finance Britain's war to defeat Napoleon. Shipments of gold to the European continent fund the Duke of Wellington's armies and also those of Britain's allies, Prussia and Austria. The Rothschild brothers coordinate their activities across the continent and develop a network of agents, shippers, and couriers to transport gold across war torn Europe. Were it not for Rothschild's limitless fortune, the Allies would surely have had to make peace with Napoleon by now. There is a lull in fighting over the winter of 1812 to 1813, as both the Russians and the French rebuild their forces. Napoleon is then able to field 350,000 troops. Emboldened by France's failure in Russia, Prussia joins with Austria, Sweden, Russia, Great Britain, Spain, and Portugal in a new coalition. Napoleon assumes command in Germany and inflicts a series of defeats on the coalition, culminating in the Battle of Dresden in August 1813. Despite these stunning successes against multiple armies, the losses continue to mount against Napoleon. The French army is eventually pinned down by a force twice its size at the Battle of Leipzig. This is by far the largest battle of the Napoleonic Wars and cost 90,000 casualties in total. March 1814. The four powers that defeated Napoleon Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia all agree to ally for 20 years, promising to fight together to stop France if it ever got too powerful again. The Treaty of Chalmont is a series of separately signed but identically worded agreements between the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, the Russian Empire, and the United Kingdom. The treaty will draw the powers of the Sixth Coalition into a closer alliance in the event that Napoleon rejects the territory losing surrender terms recently offered to France. Each ally agrees to put 150,000 soldiers in the field against France and to guarantee the European peace, once obtained, against French aggression for 20 years. The terms of the treaty were largely written by Lord Castlereagh, the British foreign minister, who offered cash subsidies, Rothschild money, to keep the other armies in the field against Napoleon. April 1814. Napoleon withdraws back to France, his army having been reduced to 70,000 soldiers and 40,000 stragglers, against more than three times as many Allied troops. The French are surrounded as British forces press from the south and other coalition forces position to attack from the German states. Paris is captured by the coalition in March 1814. On April 2, 1814, the French Senate declares Napoleon deposed. 
When Napoleon learns that Paris has surrendered, he proposes that the army march on the capital. That is when some of his marshals mutiny. They confront Napoleon and force him to announce his unconditional abdication only two days later. The combination of Rothschild's endless money, cunning British intrigue, limitless allied manpower, the Spanish ulcer, and the disastrous typhus-infested retreat from Russia are all just too much for the French to overcome. After Napoleon's abdication, King Louis XVIII is installed as ruler of France. Napoleon is exiled to the island of Elba off the Italian coast, where he is given authority over the island's 12,000 inhabitants. February 1815 Separated from his wife and sons, and aware of rumors that he might be shipped to a remote island in the middle of the Atlantic, Napoleon stuns Europe by escaping from Elba with less than 1,000 supporters and soldiers in February of 1815. Soon after landing on the French mainland, a regiment of French soldiers, under orders to arrest him, confronts their former emperor. Napoleon approaches the regiment alone, dismounts his horse, and shouts, Here I am! Kill your emperor if you wish! The soldiers respond with, Long live the emperor! and march with Napoleon to Paris. King Louis XVIII flees. Napoleon quickly raises another army. He will once again confront the Rothschild-funded British and Prussians at the decisive Battle of Waterloo in Belgium. The powers at the Congress of Vienna declare Napoleon an outlaw. On March 25, 1815, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and the United Kingdom bind themselves to put 150,000 men each into the field to end his rule. This sets the stage for the last conflict on the Napoleonic Wars. The Battle of Waterloo. Again financed by the House of Rothschild, the British, led by the Duke of Wellington, and the Prussians, led by Gebhard von Blücher, amass their seventh coalition armies near the, near the northeastern border of France. Napoleon is forced to preemptively attack France's enemies before they can unleash a massive coordinated invasion of France, along with other members of this latest Allied coalition. The Battle of Waterloo is fought on Sunday, June 18, 1815, in present-day Belgium. The French army nearly wins the great battle. It is only the late arrival of Prussian reinforcements that suddenly tilts the battle against the French. The defeat at Waterloo marks the end of Napoleon's hundred days return from exile and ends his rule as emperor once and for all. The French monarchy is restored to the Bourbons for the second time. The very word Waterloo has since become synonymous with one's final defeat. In terms of blood and death, the British, Bourbon, Royalist, Rothschild obsession with removing Napoleon proved to be very costly. It would be 100 years before the world was to see mass war death on such a scale again. Military deaths are estimated to be somewhere between 2.5 million and 3.5 million. Civilian death tolls related to the war vary from 1 million to 3 million. Thus, estimates of total dead, both military and civilian, can reasonably range from 3.5 million to 6.5 million. To put those numbers into perspective, the death toll was 5 to 10 times greater than that of the deadly American Civil War of the 1860s. France and Allies 371,000 killed in action 800,000 killed by wounds, accidents or disease, primarily in the disastrous invasion of Russia 600,000 civilians, 65,000 French allies, mainly Poles fighting for independence from Russia, Prussia, 1.8 million French and allies, mostly Germans and Poles, dead in action, disease, and missing, 1.7 million Frenchmen from pre-1792 borders, Britain and allies, 120,000 Italian dead or missing, 289,000 Russian dead or missing, 134,000 Prussian dead or missing, 376,000 Austrian dead or missing, 585,000 Spanish dead, 200,000 Portuguese dead or missing, 311,806 British dead or missing. Total, 2,015,000. British Navy, 1804 to 1815, killed in action, 6,663, Shipwrecks, drownings, and fire, 13,621. Wounds and disease, 72,102. Total, 92,386. British Army, 1804 to 1815. Killed in action, 25,569. 
Wounds, Accidents, and Disease, 193,851. The Rothschild brothers utilize courier pigeons to rapidly communicate amongst themselves and their agents. The network provides Nathan Rothschild with political and financial information ahead of his peers, giving him an advantage in the financial markets. After the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo, Rothschild receives word of the battle's outcome long before anyone else. Rothschild will use the insider information of Wellington's victory to become Britain's supreme master. He orders his brokers to sell off his holdings. Other brokers assume that Rothschild has therefore learned that Britain has lost at Waterloo. A panic sell-off drives the market down to historic lows. Rothschild then buys up the devalued market at bargain prices. When the public learns of Britain's victory over Napoleon, the stocks skyrocket to new heights. Nathan Rothschild multiplies his massive fortune by 20 times. 1814 to 1815. After Napoleon's defeat, the European powers continue their meetings in Vienna, Austria. Political boundaries are redrawn. Old disputes are settled. These conferences are known as the Congress of Vienna. Though many nations participate, the Congress is run by the Big Four, Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria. The most notable decision reached at Vienna is the consolidation of 360 small German states into a German confederation of 38 states. Arrangements made by the four great powers ensure that future disputes will be settled in a manner that will avoid the wars of the previous 20 years. Although the Congress of Vienna preserves the balance of power in Europe, it does not check the spread of the red revolutionary movements that are being born and will spread across Europe some 30 years later. Balance of power politics serves the interests of the globalist planners because it allows for a disobedient nation or nations to be checked, challenged, and controlled by a group of other nations of equal power. The Rothschilds and their agents will soon wield enormous financial influence in three of the big four nations. Only Russia still remains free of Rothschild's reach. 1815 After the final defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon is exiled to the island of St. Helena, 1,000 miles off the coast of West Africa. King Louis XVIII is installed on the throne and, predictably, allows Napoleon's infamous decree against usury to expire in 1818. The Rothschilds are back in control. Rumors of Napoleon returning will continue to occasionally circulate throughout Europe. Napoleon is neglected by his British captors and will finally die in 1821, at age 51, from what appears to be arsenic poisoning. 1815-1848 in the political vacuum left by Napoleon's removal, Rothschild's communist subversive groups as well as semi-controlled nationalist groups grow and spread throughout the European continent. This movement spontaneously erupts during the bloody and chaotic European Spring of 1848. In that same year, Karl Marx publishes the Communist Manifesto. Marx himself is distantly related to the Rothschilds through marriage. By destroying Napoleon and buying up Great Britain at the same time, the Rothschild family was able to unleash its New World Order gang to subvert Europe. The spontaneous nationalist and red revolutions of 1848 will permanently weaken Europe's political structures, setting the stage for the disastrous wars and revolutions of the coming centuries. 1918. Fast forward 100 years. Throughout the Napoleonic Wars, the Rothschild-Britain complex skillfully maneuvered the Russian, Prussian, German, and Austrian empires to keep fighting against Napoleon. To that end, Nathan Rothschild stood by with limitless financing. How ironic, how short-sighted, how poetically tragic that a century later it was the very same Rothschild-Britain complex, now with American assistance, that delivered the post-World War I death blow to each of those empires. For the full story on this centuries-old saga, read the two-volume illustrated epic, Planet Rothschild, also by M.S. King. A Final Thought had Napoleon succeeded in ruling France and influencing European affairs, Rothschild's New World Order communism would have been killed in its infancy. So, too, would the plague of Jewish moneylending, which still enslaves Europe and America. Again, we say, what tragic irony that the British, Prussians, Austrians, and Russians, who allied against Napoleon, would one day all see their own nations externally conquered or internally subverted by the very same Rothschild New World Order Reds who financed the endless wars against Napoleon.
Napoleon had the stuff of legend running through his veins. It would be more than 100 years before Europe and the world would again see another giant like him. His name? Adolf Hitler. Suggested reading The Bad War, also by M.S. King.